Grada Quilomba is a Portuguese interdisciplinary artist and writer living in Berlin. In addition to solo exhibitions in Lisbon and now in Toronto, her work has been seen in numerous group exhibitions around the world, including Documenta 14 in Kassel, Germany, and the 32nd Sao Paulo Biennale in Brazil. Grada has performed in venues such as Maxim Gorky Theater in Berlin, the Secession Museum in Vienna, and Witz Theater in Johannesburg. She's the author of the book Plantation Memories, Episodes of Everyday Racism from 2008, which informs works in Secrets to Tell. She earned a PhD in philosophy from Freie Universität Berlin in 2008, and has taught at various international universities, including the Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, where she was an associate professor until 2013. We'll begin today's program with a screening of uh, Illusions, Volume 1, Narcissus and Echo, uh, followed by conversation between uh, Grada and our, uh, the Power Plants director, Gaetan Verna, um, after which we'll show some clips from Illusions, Volume 2, uh, and have some questions from you, the audience. So uh, please put your hands together for Illusions, Volume 1, and our conversation. All right, so, oh my god. <laughs> um, I think that, um, I mean, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, talk, we'll start talking about the work, because I think having seen uh, Illusion One really, um, to me, introduces your practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, so, it's so fitting that at the end of it, Illusion One, you do talk about the griot. You know, you explain to people mm. what is your role and, or what's the role that you've given to yourself or the voice that you've given to yourself. And um, so I think in order to, uh, to start the conversation, if you can, you know, tell us, you know, why you've, you, you've chosen, you know, after a career of uh, being a university professor and how you came to the point where you decided that, you know, you need to take it upon yourself to be that modern day griot. And as griot, most in most communities are men, that you as a woman would take that role, you know, mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's, well, first, it's so wonderful to be here. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy to be here. And I'm so happy that we manage you, Gaetan, with Inês Grosso, that you managed to bring this solo exhibition from Mount Lisbon to Toronto. And, um, and that we just met last week at the Berlin Biennale and are now here talking about the work and opened yesterday is wonderful. Um, uh, yes, the Crio, I think in most of my practice, I've been very busy with, uh, re with questions or reflecting what is knowledge production and what is knowledge and what is acknowledged as knowledge and what is not. And, uh, what knowledge do we have? Um, I think this, uh, these were questions that were very present during the time uh, lecturing as a professor at university, uh, where you work with a large number of students who know so little about who they are and their history, um, or know so much from a dominant perspective and know so little about the colonial history and the history of oppression. So um, I used to make this game uh, with some students at the Humboldt University in Berlin about uh, what, who knows what, mm -hmm. and uh, we would make a quiz on the, in the room um, uh, with very simple questions like, what was the Berlin uh, Conference? Mm -hmm. Uh, and they did not know, even though they were in the fifth, sixth semester of their studies. They did not know that uh, Bismarck invited all European countries, uh, including America, to come to Berlin. And they sat around a table and put the map of Africa on the top of this table. And then with a ruler divided the country in, in several pieces among themselves. So very basic information that was not there, or 
which countries were colonized by Germany, for instance, uh, and so on and so on. So um, questions that, answers that you should have since the primary school, but that you can go as far in your career without having any clue of a global history and of a history of oppression. Uh, so then it comes to question, so what do we know? And what do we have to know? And how far can you go without knowing? And which knowledge is acknowledged as such and which knowledge is not? And whose knowledge is this? So it was very much around these questions of knowledge production. Um, and how do we produce knowledge? And I was always very interested on having, on creating very hybrid projects where this knowledge production brings different layers and different disciplines. Um, so the storytelling and the creo, the film, the video, the choreography, the performance, um, the installation were elements that were always included in my work somehow. Uh, it was always a very hybrid work and where also theory is included. And I love that idea of, of creating this hybridity where you can place the work everywhere and nowhere. And I thought that this capacity to be everywhere and nowhere is uh, not a rebellious act, but an act of the colonization. It's where you displace things, you put things, it, it changed the order of, 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 the, of the protocol, and we need that to create new languages and new knowledges. So it was something that came from one project to the next, that grew with me and I grew with the projects and with the artists that I've met along the way and the people I've met. And this idea of, the, um, of, of illusions came at the very end of the Biennale of, uh, um, the, of Sao Paulo. And I, I, I've met uh, Jochen uh, Vols, who was the director of the Biennale of Sao Paulo. And Gabi Nobo was my uh, curator, and who's now directing the Biennale of Berlin. And I, I told them about this idea, and they said, please do it, please do it. But we didn't have money anymore. The money was over because the Biennale was open already. But they, were, they insisted that I do it. And we only had money for one day shooting. So I had to shoot this project in one day with, oh, with around 2,000 euros. That's the money I had. And the rest I had to invest from myself. But I said, well, I was talking with Jochen and with, uh, with Kavi, and he said, but please do it, it's so important. And I was before installing the Desire project. We will talk, we'll talk about, about it. And then I was very involved with the Brazilian reality. Um, which I find it was very heartbreaking to be there as well because the colonial history is so present. And, and then I uh, was very busy with the questions of representation and invisibility. I was very busy with the fact that I would only see black bodies and bodies of color in certain places that are places to serve, to open doors to uh, press buttons, to uh, come in the elevator, to serve at parties. I was extremely... Um, Oppressed by it. It was very difficult. Uh, so it was a question, oh, this is Narcissus and Echo. Yes. And when we showed, but because we didn't have enough money, we only showed, I did this staging, <laughs> because actually then I developed it into a two-channel installation, and I did a performance. And after the performance, where I stay in front next to the, to the staging and the filming, and I am reading the story as a creole, as a woman uh, who's telling and producing knowledge and using satire and to make political comments about using story to create a critical voice. And then I, after the performance, everybody was telling me, you don't know what happened, what happened? Trump was elected. And then I went to the hotel and I switched on the television and I uh, heard that 53% of the voters of uh, Donald Trump 
were white women. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's Narcissus and the echoes, and the echoes. It made so much sense. So this is how this project was know, uh, started. It's, it's unbelievable your ability to use such you know, common Greek mythology that you know, everybody has read you know, or learned because our whole society is built on all of these myths that become mm -hmm. like the stories that, you know, whether you're black, white, wherever you're from, this is what you're taught that you need to know as the classics. And then I think that the, the, where you are, you, you've attained this mastery is to take that subject matter, which is common to people, and then to like flip it and then talk about the reality of the world in which we live. Mm -hmm. And then for, I mean, for me as a woman of color, I feel that when I hear your, when I look at this work, I totally understand my relationship to the spaces that we are forced to inhabit mm. and how much the, the dominant culture never understands our perspective into the world. I think that's why it was so urgent for me to do this a project of illusions and then to continue to the volume two to, that is yeah. now at the Berlin Biennale. Um, also because my background, I started by studying psychoanalysis. Yes. And we were more than forced to know all the Greek mythology. And, and there was a lack of, there, the mythology was not uh, framed in history mm -hmm. and political history. And I was always very busy with this idea, how do you, as a post-colonial subject, read today this mythology? How can you use this mythology to understand these pieces of history that sometimes are so incomprehensible to us. So um, I thought Narcissus really very much reflect mm -hmm. this narcissism, yes. this lack of visibility and, and of representation. The way the way you um, the way you frame it, and if we look at you know um, all these questions of skin color, all these of products beauty, of, of beauty, beauty, all these products that are made and that you know, people of color use in order to lighten their skin, the products for their hair to be straight. So everything is the echo, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's, it's a beauti well, beautiful, beautiful asad, but a, a very realistic metaphor of our society mm -hmm. where the Western world you know, mm -hmm. is always this dominant culture that everybody seems to want to be, or society forces us to see that as mm -hmm. the only value system, mm -hmm. as the only way for us to judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the, in the film, when you also reference Fanon, that's, that's mm -hmm. the, you know, the heart it's of it. Um, so I think that, um, to me, you know, it's this type of work that everybody should see. And, and I think also having the background being completely white and then mm. most of this, these works are going to be, I mean, you know, if we think of the gallery and the gallery system and the museum system and who funds museums and who mm. is a museum and who is not entering mm. these institutions, I would hope by showing this work that it resonates to the people who feel excluded and suddenly see themselves revealed through through works like that. I, I really wanted to create to work with a, a creative illusion of a white cube. Yes. And to have um, these actors, they are all theater actors, they all come from the national theater, they are all Afro-German mm -hmm. uh, actors and excellent actors and I've been working with them since a long time. And I wanted to have these bodies, mm -hmm. these black bodies, uh, in all shadows, mm -hmm. uh, in this white cube, in this white infinity. Mm -hmm. And um, because this is supposed to be an installation, uh, to channel installation, it has a very beautiful, uh, it becomes a very m beautiful metaphorical work in this white cube, and these bodies occupy this white uh, cube. Mm -hmm. And you s dismantle not only the white cube and the white infinity, but also what is whiteness. Yes. And our whiteness is presented as something so neutral, so absent, but it is not. Um, so in the hope that this work, the artistic work, brings us into a reflection of how to dismantle dominant spaces and how to 
occupy the white cube and transform the white cube into a cube where many different bodies and many different narratives can be. Yeah. So it was, um, we had a lot of fun also doing it. Well, this is, these are all the reasons that once, when um, we were approached to show this work, mm -hmm. that all I wanted to do was say yes and bring it to Toronto because I think it is, it's, your work speaks to a lot of the questions that are being raised in this city, mm -hmm. in the country, in Canada. But I would say particularly in Toronto, um, you know, uh, people raise their fists, people, you know, they're, they're, when things are not, that other voice is coming through and I think it enriches the, the, the conversations that are happening. Mm -hmm. And then at the, at the power plant, if through our programming, that's what we're trying to do also, to bring Absolutely. different voices from different places in order to, to shake us, to also make us be uh, attentive and not passive viewers, mm -hmm. but viewers that are thinking, you know? So um, I think if we, if we continue, we could uh, look at um, the, actually this is actually perfect to start with the, the shrine. You know, and, and for you to tell us about Escrava Anastasia and why uh, you've chosen to integrate her within the Desire, the Desire Pro Project. Well, um, this, uh, this, uh, the Desire Project is the main installation at this show, mm -hmm. Secrets to Tell. And uh, it was commissioned by the Biennale of Sao Paulo. And when I was invited by Jochen, I thought um, I would have the wish, the desire, but also the responsibility to create a work that evolves, that goes around Anastasia. I thought as a woman who lives in Europe and was born in Europe and grew up in Europe and and works in Europe from the African diaspora, from Angola, from Santo Mary Prinsp, um, going to Brazil, to the Americas, it would be really interesting to create a work that materializes this triangulation, Europe, Africa, Americas. Yeah. And um, that was, I, I think she somehow manifested this triangulation. So I started by choosing to create an installation of three screens with three different acts as a geography mm -hmm. that I intend to reflect upon. And uh, Anastasia was a very, very important uh, entity, religious entity and political entity for many Af African diasporic people. I grew up with this image. Ah at home, uh, it's a familiar, a very familiar to me. Um, and we don't know much about her because the, the history is not documented and published. Um, some say that she was brought from the continent of Africa uh, during the Portuguese um, slavery project to Brazil. Some say that she was born in Brazil and enslaved by the Portuguese. But there was a connection between who I am, where I am, and where I'm going. Yes. Um, and what is very beautiful about her, there's many histories, many of them are very genderized and uh, go around the beauty that yes. she was extremely beautiful yeah, and etc. And had blue eyes <laughs> and etc. I'm not interested yeah. on that story yeah. of the beauty of this woman. I, I chose to look uh, which is a, a part of the history of, of her biography that usually is erased. Mm -hmm. She, she uh, like most of women, are reduced to a beautiful, to the beauty, to mm -hmm. the body, to the beauty. But she was actually a political activist, a woman with an important voice uh, that um, had words of emancipation and of resistance, of, um, of, of, of uh, encouragement for rebellion, for the end of the horrors of slavery, um, and uh, among many other things. And she, like many other enslaved Africans, uh, were f it was forced to use a mask. And this mask was a common practice during uh, the European uh, slavery project for several reasons. 
so that enslaved Africans do not eat the goods of the master while working, so that enslaved Africans do not become the subjects that decide upon their lives by committing suicide, eating dirt, which was a common practice to escape the horrors of slavery. So um, for uh, the masters, they would be losing properties because uh, African people were seen as objects, as property. Uh, so when you commit suicide, you decide upon your life and you become a subject. Exactly. So this was to prevent the, uh, the eating dirt was a, a practice, uh, to, eat, uh, to eat the soil until suffocation. But above all, it was about implementing a fear of speaking. And I thought this is such a prominent, she raises such prominent questions still today, who can speak and what can we speak about and what happens when we start speaking, when those who were silent start speaking. When those voices, those voices become yeah. audible. Exactly. So I wanted to create as a home a small shrine of worship um, because she's related to uh, to a god of a god Oshala, who is, which is a god that takes care of peace and of the ancestors. And we offer coffee and we offer a tobacco pipe so that they smoke and coffee without sugar and a flower, a white lilian and a, can, a white candle. And we have some beads and um, I think I didn't forget, and a glass of water. <laughs> and you offer every Friday as the day to worship the the elder people and the ancestors that that carry the history. So I wanted to create this uh, memory, not to forget uh, this this game between memory and forgetting and that you cannot, you should not forget, or you you remember because you cannot forget, forget yes. before entering mm -hmm. the the so, installation, yes. the, the the digital work. So it's a little bit the past and the present, and the present which is futuristic. Um, and I think it's, it's so great that you, you didn't forget about her because it's, it's an image that I've often seen. And then, but in North America, we don't, you know, she, it's always referenced to Brazil, you know, mm, as, mm. as if it's like a completely different story, but it's the same story. It is the same story. Um, yeah. And then when I was doing some research, there's so many Portuguese films about, about yeah. Anastasia. Absolutely. Know? And, uh, and so it's, it's always interesting, again, the types of stories that are chosen to be revealed and not to be revealed. Absolutely. And then we that. come again to which knowledge is acknowledged exactly. as such and yeah. which not. And in Brazil, when I, I installed the work at, um, as, at, uh, at, at Sao Paulo, it was so beautiful because people are extremely spiritual. Yes. Uh, so they can connect with the white cube very easily. They move in the space of art and interact with art in a beautiful way that I don't know in Europe. And, uh, and we had, like here, candles. Um, and people were really coming and putting a candle and flowers to Anastasia because they know it. Really? Yes. So I wanted to create this interactive uh, a space and it was very beautiful because I had this conversation uh, with Gabi and with Jochen and we were saying it's so beautiful. This is for me what very much decolonizing mm. contemporary art is that you, you bring elements and objects that usually that disturb the white cube, that usually are not there. Yeah. But of course, when, when black artists and artists of color um, start having a platform in their contemporary arts, you have to change. You have to disrupt. Disrupt, and you have to change the narrative. Yes. Objects that were never there have to start being there. Yes. Candles that were never lighted have to start. You, yes. And that, that was very beautiful to, to, to reflect on this transformation, how, how important it is to, and how um, it's possible also in contemporary art that is not possible in many other Platforms. I, I worked for many years in the academia, in performance, in, in theatre. You cannot break the protocol. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of contemporary art where everything is possible and you can transform each space to tell a new narrative. So 
This was the work. And then the beauty was that Inês Grosso, who's a curator at MAD, went to Sao Paulo and saw the piece. And then uh, she did something extraordinary, which was uh, she brought the piece to MAD. to MAD. And it was extraordinary because I'm working since many years and I never received an invitation to show my work in Lisbon. Yeah. Again, because of colonial history. Because Portugal is a country that very much glorifies its colonial past. So um, all the artists that have a critical voice or dismantle this, this romanticism of colonialism I'm have... Not. Uh, difficult. And it's interesting because I, um, a friend of mine who's an artist, I was in Venice with him and he had come back from San Paolo and he goes, you need to meet this artist. And I said, well, what's her name? He's like, she's Cata Quilomba. And then uh, uh, there was another Portuguese curator who said, well, that's not a Portuguese name. And who is she? We don't know her, right? And then, then he said to me, she's a black Portuguese artist, but she has been living in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it's again the, same, narr the mm -hmm. same narrative, but that's where an institution can really shift, you know, the voice of a Absolutely. curator, you know, through Ines's work to kind of like, um, inter you know, impose in a certain sense, or at least make room in exactly. a collection Absolutely. to say we need that voice because this is also Portugal yeah. and, and it's a voice that maybe more Portuguese want to hear Absolutely. or the ones that don't feel that they're integrated into the collection or the museum when they come in if they hear that voice this will be around absolutely for them to come in. absolutely and, and and it was a beautiful moment because it was i think i think when you work as an artist and as a curator and as people who love arts mm -hmm. you have to have to take radical decisions yes. It has to be, I don't think it is a space for beauty. No, it's a space of politics. I think the beauty is the, to, have, to make these radical decisions yes. and to work with very, very, very complicated and very painful pieces of our history and to have the ability to create a space to reflect upon this. Mm -hmm. And this is the beauty of being an artist. Mm -hmm. I don't think being an artist is about creating beautiful things, mm -hmm. painting flowers and so yeah. For me, it's okay when others do. I think there's urgent questions that then you have to have that platform to um, manifest these very complex questions that sometimes the audience does not know how to deal with. And then it's your it's your task as an artist to elaborate works that guide somehow to maybe give some clarity or some, some vision to the audience to understand it better. So it's about taking radical decisions also for the curator and for all those that support the artist that they say, this is what we need. We need to, to move on in our history. We, we need that. And it was really beautiful because then Inej brought, brought the piece to Matt. Um, they bought the piece and then we started talking and then we said, we acquire the piece and make a, a solo installation around the piece. And then we started talking about things like who belongs to the national canon, which yeah. is a very important question. And before I was there, I was uh, in Amsterdam and in Rotterdam uh, doing, um, presenting other works, including this one. And I've met a wonderful, also a wonderful and very important intellectual, a black female intellectual in Europe, a Gloria Vecca from, from, um, uh, from the Netherlands, who was a big inspiration for me for a long time. And then we've met and um, she created this beautiful article for Venice Biennale about the national canon mm -hmm. and how uh, artists of color cannot, could never represent and be included in the national canon of uh, the Netherlands in this case, but also in other countries. And how important it is to take this radical decision such as acquiring, commissioning, uh, giving solo exhibitions and so on, to decide and to define a new, a new canon. A new canon. Yeah. And this is so, so beautiful. So when we did the show, it was bombastic, wasn't it? It was. It was bombastic. 
and people were loving it and they were waiting. Exactly. And then you see that the audience is ahead from the institutions. The audience is ready, but I sometimes the institutions it, yeah. are not willing exactly. to change and to, to make these uh, yeah. radical yeah. decisions. Because as soon as you shift the conversation, suddenly you, know, you see different people coming to the institution. And ready to. And then, and then uh, being so pleased to see these types of work and Absolutely. then stopping and saying, oh my god, I went to the gallery, I saw this work, thank you so much for bringing this here. Finally, then, yes, now. finally. So. Yeah, a, a program that deals with the present. The present, the, the, trying to help us contextualize you know, this mess in which we're in, mm. which where I often feel there's no solutions, but it's like we have to go look at the past, but look at the future, Absolutely. but then bring different voices in order to help us to Absolutely. make the right, and to make citizen decisions, you know? So I think that, that um, we should move to the, the next slide. So this is still the, some yeah. images, I think. Um, but we can maybe move even to the next to the design, piece. Uh, this, this, exactly. this is the installation of the triangulation with the three texts, with the three. I wanted to work also with the element of the perverse and to, and to have a video installation without images, mm -hmm. but with words, that the words, the message becomes very prominent and without voiceover, but with music mm -hmm. and to use music as a narrative. Yeah. Um, but we can move on maybe to the next yes. one. Excuse me. Uh, this is uh, Act 3 that starts with this question. Of I mean, what's interesting in this work, and maybe you can speak about it, is that you have these three, also your knowledge of language. So you actively use language mm. to... Um, I felt that as a spectator also, the, the three screens, mm -hmm. you know, the movement, the physical movement of the text mm -hmm. between one another, which are not, they're synced, but not synced, you know. That they are independent. They're yes. independent, mm -hmm. and there's a, there's a movement between them. Um, so can you speak about, you know, choosing this, this way of presenting them, and then how music is Can't. embedded in it? You know, I wanted to have three independent acts. But, it's, but I wanted to create the installation in a way that people can come and create a fourth narrative if they want. They can read it in different ways, yeah. uh, uh, in different directions. You can read one after the other. You can will the sentence and, 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 and it creates different narratives at the yeah. same time. And I find that very interesting to this idea that you don't have control over over your work anymore. I develop a work and then it's like a worship. When you install it, you, you give offer. it to the audience, you offer it's not yours yeah. anymore. And then the audience it explores it yeah. the way they want. And I like this idea yeah. that uh, they see things that sometimes you don't see. And with the music, I wanted very much to work with drumming, uh, with the calling, with the drumming, the calling of the griot, of the candomblé, to call, to call, to reunite, to listen, but also to use music as a form of narrative, especially in the African diaspora. Music has been, like in many oppressed communities, music is extremely important as a form of narrative and as a form of occupying space. Yes. Um, Resistance, independence, absolutely. That's something you carry with you and that you exactly can, that can never leave you because because the the you know it's your voice it's your body also exactly but also because um, black people were a, were a big part of our history the center of our history is that we were always excluded mm -hmm. we were denied access mm -hmm. to physical spaces mm -hmm, mm -hmm. officially today not by law but still so we are very absent in physical spaces. Mm -hmm. And music has been used since centuries to occupy spaces. Mm -hmm. Music is metaphysical. It flies through time and space eternally. Mm -hmm. So if someone cannot enter this space by law, by law, or because cannot have access for all the obstacles, mm -hmm. and maybe only one or three can get inside this space, as we know, 
if you play the music outside, I am forced to listen to the music because the music cannot be filtered and fly through the space yes. and occupies this space. So I wanted to play with this, um, with this aspect of, of, of the music. That, that's why music is so important in Cuba, in South Africa, in Brazil, in all these countries in that the have, US. and US, yeah. everywhere, that yeah. have a history of oppression yeah. and of exclusion and apartheid, and where many times black people are only present in the space through music, even if it's in playing, mm. and you are in a room, there's nobody else there but the music is ours. Exactly. And it has this language of resistance. Yeah. And I want maybe to bring that as a, f a way of awareness um, to the audience when they come and enter this space and they are surrounded by music and by, uh, by words to understand the complexity of what exclusion can be and, and, the, and the practice of resistance behind it. So, mm. Yeah. Should we move on? We to should. What do we have? Plantation memory? Oh, we can move on. We have. Uh, you, we can continue. I'm, I'm are you talking with Tim. We can continue. Yes. Uh, this is uh, this is the yes. other. We have two black box. Uh, the desire project and in front we installed it, made the, this uh, solo exhibition in a way that we have a second storytelling which is the plantation memory. Which is important plantation memory. Which is important, I love this work. Which started as a book. Which started as a book, which started first as a, a research where I did interviews with women from the African diaspora. But what prompted you to start the research? I think that's Actually, it started as a PhD ah. before, and so it doesn't matter. <laughs> and then I did, uh, I wrote a book, uh, which is composed as episodes of uh, everyday racism, short stories, short psychoanalytical stories. And then, um, and then, as I said before, I was very busy always with this idea of performing knowledge. How do you bring this knowledge? into arts, into performance, into how do you materialize, how do you... So I, I adapted the book and put it on stage in a theatre in Berlin. Was and I worked... Uh, not here, it was at the Ballhaus Straße, and then later I went to uh, the Festspielhaus in Berlin and then at the Gorky Theatre. And it was in Oslo uh, and in several European uh, can, uh, cities being shown. And then I worked with five actors, usually the same actors, they are all theater actors. And I wanted to bring episodes of uh, some of the episodes of the, of the book on stage and to have them performed and to work again with, uh, with the black box mm -hmm. so they are dressed in black and so you focus actually um, on their face and on their voice. I wanted the storytelling and the subjectivity mm -hmm. to be recognizable. I wanted people to look at these actors. It was also very strong to have five black actors on stage in a big theater. People are not used. used they usually it. have one yeah. playing a role that they don't want. <laughs> and um, so it was very uh, beautiful to do this work and I wanted to create, to explore this idea of the black box and the white cube. There's a contrast yes, between these works and the works in Illusion. I, in Illusion, it's, the scenario is a white cube, so it's about dismantling power oh. and bringing the dominant narratives and turning turn them upside down and reading the different layers. And in the black box, the black box is the projection where you project films, where the actors perform and speak about the experiences of being a screen of projection for what they are not. So I wanted to play with this. I think these are two different moments of my artistic work. And it's interesting how the, 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 the voice and the language is always, it's always the narrative yeah. that is Yes, yeah, the story. That I'm very yeah. fascinated yeah. with the Creole. Yeah. Also to 
And this idea that, that we, we grew up uh, with a knowledge production as with a scientific and objective and universal and that you create an object and you are the subject and you distance yourself from the object and this is very much part of this patriarchal and colonial knowledge production. Yeah. And when you go to uh, the oral to African tradition of storytelling and knowledge production, it brings so many different layers of storytelling, of imagery, um, of music, uh, of, of performance, that then I explore in this white cube, in this illusion. So I wanted to, to dismantle that somehow. Can you, for, for what the part of the audience might not have seen the, the um, the work, but can you speak a bit about what they are talking about? These are really um, uh, episodes of everyday racism that I usually seen as very subtle mm -hmm. uh, racism that um, people say, oh, I didn't mean it. Um, and then the whole book and the whole piece evolves on understanding what trauma is mm -hmm. and how traumatic racism is and how racism is actually a performance, a reenactment of the past. So is the colonial past. It's a construction. It's like a mise-en-scene mm -hmm. that, that brings the past into the present again. Racism allows the past the violence of the past to inhabit the present. That then in the Illusions, Volume 1, is the sense of timelessness. Mm -hmm. That I, f I am in the present, but I'm always being assaulted by the past. And I'm not in the past, I'm in the present. Yeah. And But then there are, I am assaulted by uh, episodes that place me in the same place where my grandmother was, where my mother was, my grandmother, mm -hmm. my great-grandmother, they told me exactly the same, the same stories. Yes. And how history repeats itself. And, it's, and, and then it's this element of what trauma is, and of this element of dehumanization, that you are placed as the other. Mm -hmm. You're placed outside humanity. So it goes all around very subtle forms of racism. Microaggressions. Right? Exactly, that are so violent yeah. and always re-enact re the colonial trauma. You, you just cannot heal. Um, there was a, there's a moment, I think, in this piece where I wrote something or I said something about a colonialism is like a wound that was never properly treated. And it's, it's always hurts, and sometimes it's sometimes infects, and sometimes bleeds. Mm -hmm. And when it bleeds or is infected, people think, are surprised, uh, and remember that is there. And then uh, we, as black artists, are called to show our work in this precise venue for this precise for the month of. But this is a continuous work. Our work cannot be shown in one venue, one, one time, in one month with one title. This is a constant, global, continuous topic that has, we have to be present in all venues, all the time, here, all here, and not because of a topic. The topic has not, should not be Parked in one place. It's, it's part of the agenda. Yeah. That's why it's so important to have these radical decisions. Yeah. We have to include these and so many other topics that are related to postcolonialism, gender, sexuality, transsexuality, intersexuality, all these. Everything that breaks the norm should be the focus. It has to be part way. it has to be part of the agendas. It's part of and this human work, humanity. It, it, it has it has to be part of the agendas. It has we have to create a normal and a normality a normal, of, yes. of, of the agendas of the of the artistic agendas of who is showing and who is commissioning, who receives money, who receives awards, who receives prizes, to endure and to produce. And I think what's what's interesting is that you know as soon as you. Um, and I've lived through it, as soon as you shift the focus and you add more of those voices, not one time, but in a succession, suddenly people go, oh, 
this is only an institution for mm. artists of color. It's very you beautiful know. what you say because, you know, um, the other day in an interview, uh, someone was asking, so uh, I, I don't know, I just said, you know, maybe 95% of the invitations, I say no. Because you cannot work with everybody and you should not work with everywhere. And you should not wor show your work everywhere. You have to show your work and work with the right people. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to work when I'm cold, when the wound mm -hmm. started bleeding yes. or is infected. Yes. They are not work. But where the work is included as a whole political, as a whole artistic program, that's very, very important. And to have that choice is so great that you can say that you can work with great people that understand your work. Um, and that the work has a message that, that leaves, you just install it and you go, and then it stays yeah, it there. Does and it's work on its and own. It's, exactly, because and it the stays seeds there. Have been planted for and it's so artists. transformative, yes. it's so beautiful. So, um, well, thank you for having said yes to us. <laughs> no, no, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, <laughs> no, I know that. But, you but know, I feel, I feel the, the connection, you know? So yeah. to me, also, you know, sometimes people send me proposals for shows, and I'm like, why would you send us this? This is not the context of what we're trying to yeah. do. And when, when Ines sent the proposal, it was like, how can we make this happen? Yes. Because we just had Kader Atia who was talking, yes. you know, about some of those, the, the, the same questions, but from a different voice, perspective, yeah. pers a different mm. perspective, and then adding your work. It's, it's, just, it's, I feel also that I treat, or we try to treat the audience as if we're taking them on a trajectory. We're trying to learn Absolutely. together. So for people who saw Kader and now see your work, they're going to understand that that story or who saw, you know, other shows that we've yeah. done from Unfinished Conversation to mm. Maria Upfield to, yeah. you know, and, and, and I think also it's important that what I wish we could achieve is to break the silos, right? Mm. So that, um, you know, uh, black communities don't only come and see black artists. I mean, that's not... Mm -hmm. You know, that's let's but say there's, the, the it, mm, there's so much more of the the dominant culture being force fed to everyone. So that's not necessarily the situation, but also that indigenous you know mm -hmm. communities come and see that work and see themselves and their own struggle mm -hmm. reflected, you know, in in your work in the different artists that we mm -hmm. show, so that we try to figure out how universal our practices are, and that depending it it doesn't matter. It is important to acknowledge where the work comes from, but the person who's going to receive it can be from all over the world mm -hmm. and should be able to understand it, yeah, even if it's not their story, but to understand that we all have a role to play mm -hmm. in, in changing those, those Absolutely. narratives. Absolutely. You know? So a public gallery open to everyone and presenting this work within a context of, uh, that hopefully will make our visitors, you know, reflective of some of, and what I think is really interesting because the the, the way you've chosen those sentences, they're so simple. Mm -hmm. And for, I would say for all black people, we will see these micro, you're reenacting microaggressions that mm -hmm. we have continuously. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully for the others who are the perpetrator, but not necessarily knowing they're doing it, Hopefully, it will resonate in their mind that when you say this, this, you know, this has that effect on the person. One that um, stuck to me is this question of where are you from? Yes. This um, constant, and then you go, no, I'm I'm from Portugal, but really, but from where? Or when did you arrive? And then you feel like saying to the person, am I asking you all of your DNA? Mm -hmm. But to us, it's always a first question that mm -hmm. people want to ask, and then it's trying to figure out. You know, often people have very good intention. It's not necessarily to call on the fact that we're not the right mm -hmm. color. It's because they might be individually interested, you know. Mm -hmm. But then for some, when somebody doesn't know someone, why would that be your first question? I am but it's here. a question of power, isn't yes. it? And I think then um, it's about the question of power and who has the power and the privilege to touch 
the hair and to ask the questions and to, ex to undress the other person and remain unmarked. And this is a very asymmetric power relation. And it's a colonial relation yes. to describe and to objectify and to understand. Categorize. Exactly. And you have to deliver. Yeah. You giving a service. So there's this power asymmetry. I think the beauty of then creating works is that I think when I do the works that are here, I give a lot of, of myself. I think you, you come to a place, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, no, keep going. Okay. Um, we, uh, I think you, you put yourself, there's a, salt, a certain vulnerability uh, that you, you have, I think, to create works, you have to be in a very vulnerable place, or you have to risk so much to the point that you don't know if you go that too that, far. That far yeah. And I think this is this moment of vulnerability and of honesty that then the audience understands and connects with you. They feel it. They and feel they can, it. I think then everybody can identify yes. with the work. It doesn't matter which biography they have, exactly. because there's, I think that's the beauty of creating art, is that uh, you go very, very deep into your biography and into this political frame. I think when you take that risk is when the work is really, really something. No? It, yes. it, it really uh, brings you Arresting. there. Yes. yes, and I think that allows this vulnerability, allows a lot of people to identify with. I remember when we showed the Desire Project first time in Brazil, there were all these different communities coming and writing and, and as everywhere with the most beautiful words from from the queer community, from, from all these different communities coming, from the feminist movement, from this, all these voices saying, oh, I understand, I understand. I'm, I'm, I, I, I understand. Um, so many white students saying, no, I understand. Thank it's, it's, I think that's what art is there for, to create a metaphorical work that guides you into complex questions and give you symbols. Uh, and you metaphors could... and images to deal with something that sometimes is very unreasonable. Yes. Somehow. So should we should we um, look at Illusion Two? Should we? Do you want Small. to see? So I Illusion think... Two is a, a piece that was just open at the at the Berlin Biennale, and I kind of forced. Uh, I was really forced. I, she was I didn't very want forced. to, <laughs> but to, to show us like a few excerpts in it, and then after just that, very important is that you know this is a, a two-channel installation, so we the sound is from a live performance, so um, it's not it's in the not, best quality. It's not in the way but, that it's supposed but to Gaetan be. But Gaetan insisted so much on on seeing it, and I think it's good to see it. So we'll just see a few excerpts. We, we see it, as and a, then after we'll do Q and A's. So, I mean, thank you so much, Brother. I think we could have gone on forever, but then... <laughs> but if there's any questions, uh, Josh has a microphone. And Tim, if you want to put slides from The Illusions too, you can put while they, we are um, talking. Thank you. I think that was a lot to absorb. Uh, any questions from... Anyone in the audience? These are images from Illusions uh, 2 on Oedipus. So they will just yeah. on slide. No questions? Ah. Thank you for your talk, Gara, and the conversation, Gaitan. I want to ask you about psychoanalysis because it is unusual for most artists to acknowledge that that's something that interests them or that uh, is a foundation for their work. So I'm, I'm curious about the psychoanalytic component of your work or, or your uh, approach to mm -hmm. psychoanalysis. I mean, I can see it, obviously, in the myths mm -hmm. and the connection to uh, some psychoanalytic theory, but I'm just wondering how you 
place psychoanalysis in your process of working, mm. if that makes sense. Yes, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, when we look at it, I, I use a lot of psychoanalysis. I'm, I'm very, very, um, I f I'm very fascinated about psychoanalysis. But I'm much more fascinated about arts. And I was born in Lisbon, and I grew up at the periphery of Lisbon, where most of the black communities were. Uh, it was a place of a certain poverty and exclusion. And I think I was one of the first girls who had the privilege to study at university back then. So I wanted to do arts. But it was very important to do something serious. So I was in this dilemma of arts was seen as something, as a hobby. And it was important to do something serious. Um, so I decided to, to do psychoanalysis, clinical psychology and psychoanalysis. And um, because it was also the most fascinating thing, because it has to do with storytelling. It has to do with unconscious story. Uh, and I realized how psychoanalysis and arts work with the same material. You work with the unconscious. You work with metaphors, with associations, with images, and with symbols. So you don't work on the conscious level. The conscious level is just a manifestation of the unconscious. And that's what we do when you create art. You have to leave these, the, the, the surface of the iceberg, and you have to dare to, to dive into the and to the ocean to see the iceberg. And the iceberg is much bigger than what you see upstairs. So, um, and then I realized how, how, how similar, how close it was. So uh, back then, I studied and I worked uh, with war survivors. That was a very important work for me. I had a great mentor who was a survivor of the Holocaust. Um, his family coming from Germany to Portugal in the hope of crossing the Atlantic and not crossing, like many, so remained in Lisbon. So I've learned with him so much about what trauma, what political history is, and how political history manifests in the biographies, in people. Um, in the dreams, in the metaphors, in the symbolisms, in the images. And then we st I started writing and writing. At the time, there was war in Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau. And children were arriving in planes every day. I was very, very young and working with, in this psychiatry and working um, with war and trauma and writing and writing. And then I got very interested on um, bringing these stories into performance and into arts, which was very difficult in Lisbon. And then I received a PhD sc uh, scholarship from the German government, who acknowledged my work from outside, which was not acknowledged in Lisbon. And I left and started then creating this very hybrid work. So psychoanalysis was always somehow part of my practice, like many other disciplines, like film, like theater, like choreography, like music, like storytelling. There's all these different components that are there. And I find in this hybridity for me is very important. It's very fascinating to bring, not to do abstract work, but to bring very political, theoretical, text or knowledges into the arts and translate it into a new languages. Because I was very worried that there's a separation. Many times I entered museums and saw exhibitions that meant nothing to me. I was just walking through. I was just passing by. You look, you pass by. You look, you pass by. I don't understand why people got money to do this. I had such urgent things to say and to do. And I always saw the same artists doing the same things. And there was a parallel world then 
there's a very political, theoretical work that is so boring at the same time and that nobody can really understand. That remains here in the head. That's why we have these boosts uh, in the, um, when we enter universities, you have a, 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 a head without body. We're supposed to be disembodied artists, disembodied theorists. And this was really my, 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 my inspiration to do the work. I wanted to do this, this hybrid work where the knowledge and, the, and, and these political messages and this, all this comes into one and the beauty and create images to, to tell these stories. How do you create? an image, how do you create an imagery, how do you stage such text, how do you um, make this knowledge vivid, how do you perform it so that people really have access, emotional access to these very complex things. So um, this is how it comes together somehow. Thank you. Hello, hi. Um, thank you so much, Grada. Thank you. Um, I, I haven't really got a question. It's maybe some observations. Um, a, it's a really fantastic installation and presentation. And I think for me, that sense of kind of power and identification being in the installation and the way it's presented and the synthesis of kind of the intellectual, the spiritual, the emotional, I think is really, really powerful. So thank, thank, you. You. Um, thank you. I guess one of the things I was thinking about with this idea of the kind of the griot was mm. maybe thinking about the kind of structure of call and response mm. and really thinking about how, in a way, the work for me functions in, in that manner of call and response in terms of um, a structure of a discourse. Mm. And I think, um, you know, the way that you kind of posit kind of objects and text and rhythms and conversations and dialogues is so kind of generous and generative. Um, and in addition to that, I was also thinking about this kind of, this thing about being a teacher, the kind of pedagogical kind of role of, that you've occupied as an academic. Um, and it, it's not really a question, but I, I guess I'm just musing on this idea of the kind of function and power of call and response mm. um, as a practice. Absolutely, that's quite beautiful because there is this element, um, not only in the desire project that you, the drumming is calling you to enter the space and before you enter the space you have to worship Anastasia and you have to read and acknowledge and then you enter the space. That's why we have a wall before you enter the video installation. There is a wall that you have to pass, uh, to go through this passage to enter, you have to go through um, the ancestors before, uh, and then you enter. So that's really, and the drummings uh, are calling, the drums are calling you, and the music. But also in the opposite installation, video installation, plantation memories, which actually I didn't say, but we staged this some years ago, I think in 2013, I believe, or 15, and it was an archive I never really used. I did two small videos to connect, to show people that I in on YouTube, and I never worked uh, on this uh, piece. And only uh, two, three months ago, when I had a solo show at the Goodman Gallery in Johannesburg, I decided to go to the archive and create this piece that is now being shown. So it was a work that was holding, waiting uh, to be to be to be produced uh, to be, yeah, produced as such. So, and when we installed it, um, we wanted to create again this call and response is very beautiful because we have the five actors sitting in five chairs with metal uh, 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 legs and in black. And then I was asking Gaetan, do you have chairs? I was asking um, uh, Caroline and Gaetan, do you have chairs? And they said, yes, we have chairs from Kadar, right, that were used. Uh, uh, and I wanted to have these very five same chairs facing the, the actors. And they are really in conversation with 
uh, with the audience, that you sit face to face in a tete-a-tete, -tete, uh, listening. Uh, this act of listening, this um, also to give this idea, I find this um, dynamic between listening and silencing and speaking very important. Um, and to dismantle this fantasy that uh, that, uh, that we have always been speaking since centuries. We have always been producing knowledge. But there has been an inability to listen. So um, what we actually need, for me personally, it's very much at the center of what I'm doing now. This storytelling has to do with creating spaces in this white cube where people sit to listen. And, um, and in that way, I want really to explore this triangulation of speaking, silencing, and listening. And I find this act of listening, of going to a gallery and sit, and to have this, sorry, this face to face with the stories, and just sit there, and there to listen for 10 minutes what this piece is telling you, what probably rarely happen in your whole entire biography. Um, I think to, also it's what they were saying, what they it, are saying. Exactly, but listening to that, to sit and to listen, not to tell how it is, but let the others produce the narrative and the knowledge, and let me listen. This moment, I find that very beautiful. And the scale, I would say the scale also, the choice of having the scale of the, of the, the actors Mimicking, Mimicking exactly. Like in Illusions, we created the, the, the shooting in a way that the actors are always face to face with the audience. It is always a call response. I think it's quite beautiful what you said because it's me and you, you and me, and that creates an intimacy and the opportunity to identify and to create a dialogue with the pieces. And this is very much what I've wanted, so you observed it beautifully. Yeah, in that way. Yes, absolutely. Oh, very good. Uh, well, uh, uh, thanks so much to uh, to all of you for coming. Uh, but a very special round of applause for Grada Kilomba and so Gaetan yeah. Verna for our conversation. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, the power plant remains open uh, today until six o'clock. So, uh, so if you want to go on into the exhibition or go back to the exhibition, please do. Uh, and this round of exhibitions uh, this season remains open through September 3rd. Uh, plenty of programs coming up uh, through the season, so check out our program guide or our website at thepowerplant.org. Um, I'm assuming Get, uh, Getan and uh, Grara will stick around a few more minutes, but I'll invite everyone out uh, of, uh, of the theater who has to change over for uh, another production. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you. once again. <laughs>